This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. We're recording now. Yay! This is what you can look forward to on episode 174 of Skywalking Through Neverland. When you walk into Walt's Barn, who do you see? <gasps> Margaret Carey! Our fairy pod mother. It was basically a game of Capture the Flag, only it was Capture the Bunnies! <laughs> What my point is that it all comes back to the Star Wars holiday special. Saw his little footprints, his little three-toed footprints in the snow. I'm like, Yoda, put some shoes on. But yeah, as the adage goes, if you don't see the body, they're not dead. And guess which one you had to press? The red button. <laughs> mean Joe Green drinks the whole Coke, and I'm sure the little boy meant, I, dude, I meant a sip. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Hello. Skywalkers. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. You are skywalking through Neverland. Hey, hey, Skywalkers. Are you ready to talk some Star Wars and Disney this week? Well, if your answer is a big resounding yes, then we want to welcome you all to Skywalking, Skywalking Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. This is your fun-filled, positive Star Wars and Disney podcast that takes you through a tour through the many years and decades of fandom. Awesome. I am Richard Woloski, and now everyone, please say hello to my sweetie wife, Sarah. Hello, and hello to our Star Wars and Disney family, and Harry Potter family, because it's been 20 years since Harry Potter has been out in book form. So I know uh, fun things were going around on Facebook yesterday. Have they ever done a follow-up to the first book? Yes, I think they have. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, we like to start each and every show with a giant Wookiee hug to our family of Skywalkers who listen to the show every week. And of course, the SkyTubers over here and the Face Huggers who watch our live stream on YouTube and Facebook. And everyone who tweets at us, we are at Skywalking Pod. And you know what? We just love it when we all share the positivity about our collective adventure through fandom. And once again, if you'd like to head to our YouTube channel where we have many things going, not just our show, you can go to youtube.com slash skywalking through Neverland to subscribe. Now, we are recording this from sunny Long Beach, California, where it is a very balmy 97 degrees on June the 27th, 2017. Now, Minnie, what time is it? It's 9.56. Good morning. Well, good morning to you too, Minnie. Now, coming up on this week's show, we're going to continue our recap of the Clone Wars micro-series. On episode 169, we did volume 1. Now, we're going to continue with volume 2. And joining us to break down this volume will be our own book reviewer, Jocasta Drew Kaplan, and Skywalker Nitsan Harrell. Now, this is part of our lead-up to Forces of Destiny. Yeah. And this follows the same micro-format and animation style of Clone Wars. It's so cool. So, you know what? We also have shout-outs on this episode, a Skywalker of the Week, and things we want to share. But first... We want to invite all the Skywalkers to join us on upcoming episodes because we're going to ask you for your highlight fandom moments. Mm. All right. Now, we're going to start this new segment today. Okay. And it's going to be reoccurring, so we want to hear from everybody. And this is highlights, highlights and fandom, and we want to get your take. Now, what do you think pushed fandom to a whole new level and a whole different direction? It could be a film release, a TV debut, a toy, collectible, etc. And what personal angle do you have with it? So it's not just a story, but what was it that pushed fandom? So do you think something like the Thrawn novels being released in 91, would that be something that kind of changed the direction of fandom? 
Oh, very, very much so. Okay. And then because, personally for me, you know, that's where right. my fandom kind of blossomed. Yeah. Heir to the Empire. Good okay. example right there. Yeah. That really, really pushing fandom. Yeah. Hey, that was the book that woke fandom up. <laughs> so something, yeah, really. something like that. Now, if you had seen our podcast stage show at Star Wars Celebration Orlando, we did something very similar. And I thought, wow, there's so many great moments that really pushed fandom to a whole new level and a whole new direction. Like something that comes to mind right now for me is the Star Wars storybook that came out in 1978 mm -hmm. because we didn't have VHS, we didn't have Blu-rays, we didn't have YouTube. We had we had books. Okay. And we had to go through these books and that's what really pushed us through the, the fandom years between films because back in the 70s and 80s, three years, wow, that was... That was a lifetime. And now we also want to open this up to Disney fandom as well. Is there something that pushed your Disney fandom and something that changed the course of Disney fandom? Like, actually, Walt Disney dying would be kind of a moment there. Although that wasn't personal to me, but that kind of changed the course of the Disney studios. Right. And of course, if you can make it more personal, it yes. makes it much more interesting, too. Yeah, definitely. All right. Now, we can either do this over Skype. We can arrange a Skype call with you, or you could just send in a pre-recorded message. Now, there's no time frame on this since it's a reoccurring segment, but if you do submit a pre-recorded message, send to share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com and keep it at about a minute or two. It's always a good time length. Okay. Yeah, just enough to tell your story and what... What that means to you. Yeah. Start with your name. Yes. If you're with a podcast or a website, go ahead and give that a plug. And then start it off with, I think a big push in fandom is when... There you go. Right. So easy as that. And there's so many different answers we've been getting. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. But now let's kick off this new fandom highlight segment. And we're open to names for this segment. <laughs> with Dave Parfit from AdventuresByDaddy.com. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a great adventure took place. Hey, hey, Sarah and Richard. This is Dave Parfit from AdventuresByDaddy.com, and I am here to tell you about a moment in fandom. For me, it goes all the way back to 1977, thinking back when Star Wars itself was released. I was able to see that movie in the theater with my father. I think I've told you about that before. But in my family, we were only able to see movies once. Dad was of the mindset that we've seen that. Why would we spend money to see it again? If we're going to go to the movie theater, we're going to see something different. So I had one chance to see Star Wars. That was it. So my savior and my moment in fandom, my highlight in fandom, Columbia Record House. Columbia Record House saved me. Along that time, in 1977, we got one of those mailers, and we could select nine or ten LPs. Yes, these were vinyl records, and I saw in the catalog, they had the story of Star Wars and the Star Wars soundtrack by the London Symphony Orchestra, and those were my selections from Columbia Record House. I listened to that story of Star Wars with the booklet, that LP. I listened to it incessantly. That was the only way that I could continue to get my Star Wars. Couldn't see the movie again in the theater. Had to wait for some time unnamed later when it would come out, maybe on HBO or on video years down the road. But for me, it was the story of Star Wars LP that I got from Columbia Record House. And that is my highlight in fandom. Talk to you later. Bye. Remember, the Force will be with you. Always. So Dave had a really great fandom moment there with the story of Star Wars, the record that, like the book, that was what kept you going through to the next next film, the next release, the next something. Mm -hmm. And like like Dave, 
I listened to that story of Star Wars, I can't tell you how many times, <laughs> to the point where I would see the movie and think, wait a minute, that's not how it goes. Because ah. I was used to the edited version Is, of the record. Okay. And does the record also have like bigs in it or no? No, no. Okay, okay. No, it barely had the movie itself in it. <laughs> and okay. it had the nar- narration by Roscoe Lee Brown, which was good. He's got a great voice, but I... Wanted to say, hey, Roscoe, shh, let's let the story do the talking, okay? Gotcha. Because he would sometimes interrupt over the dialogue or something, the way it was, the way it was edited. Mm-hmm. I wanted to hear every second that I could. So thank you, Dave. That was a, a great moment because, once again, that really pushed the fans who had, who had few and far between movies. At that point, it was just the movies. No shows, no video games, no nothing. We had that to get us through. Right. So the book, you could see the pictures, but now we could hear Oh, it's like Reese's peanut butter cups. If you got one and the other, the book and the record, I never did that as a kid. Oh, wow. I could flip the book and listen to the re- Oh. You didn't do that? No, I didn't. Why not? I, I need a way back machine right now. <laughs> you need a time turner. I, I didn't think about it until right now. I could, I could have one medium and the other to form this one big collective Wonder Twin Power medium. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. So once again, Skywalkers, we want to hear from you about your Star Wars and Disney fandom highlights. Yes. So please, once again, send those to share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com or email us there and say you want to record and we'll set up a time. All right. With that, let's move on to Things Things We we want Want to Share. Things we want to share. Things we want to share. Things we want to share. So on Father's Day, we did several really awesome things. And one, well, for one thing, my my dad is very tech savvy. He loves new technology. He's an electrical engineer and he just he just loves anything new. So we thought that taking him to the IMAX VR Center in LA would be the perfect Father's Day thing to do. So that is what we did. And we've been planning on this for months and months and months, but We'll get around to it sometime, and that sometime came last Sunday. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So it was amazing. We, of course, there's many different experiences you can try, one of which is Trials on Tatooine, which is the experience that Trisha experienced from Celebration Europe. And so we were like, okay, well, we all have to do this one. If you ever wanted to be in Star Wars, this was your opportunity. Mm-hmm. It, it was like being in Star Wars. Yeah. Now, this... Uh, what was it, 10 minutes, 10 minute experience, Mm -hmm. had a storyline to it. Now, Sarah, go ahead and read the opening crawl. Okay. Like every Star Wars adventure, except for Rogue One. Right, so you- Gotta start with a crawl. Well, first of all, you put on these glasses, you're given a little controller in your hand, it's like a wand, and then you wear this like backpack that has move, like- Sensors. Well, sensors, but it has, um, what is it? Like it moves, like it'll shake your body when, when something like a big, like a- like the Millennium Falcon flies over you. So it, you know. that's what helps give it the 4D experience. Yeah, exactly. So so you're standing here in the middle of space and you see this crawl come up like under your feet and it says, It is a time of rebuilding. Having defeated the evil galactic empire, the Rebel Alliance has reformed as the New Republic. After many journeys to distant corners of the galaxy, uncovering secrets from the forgotten past... Luke Skywalker stands ready to create a new Jedi Order. One hopeful Padawan is studying the ways of the Force on a distant desert world, awaiting an important delivery from Han Solo. And who is that hopeful Padawan? (gasps) It's you! Yeah! You get to be that hopeful Padawan. Yeah! So within this 10-minute experience, the Millennium Falcon flies over you and lands right beside you. And I don't know about you, Sarah, but I found myself kind of ducking and weaving so I wouldn't get hit by by the boarding ramp. Mm-hmm. And it was like you were right there. I mean, you actually felt like you could feel the wind from the Falcon landing. And R2 comes out and is sitting right by you. And then my, I don't know about you, but my guy didn't tell me anything about how to control the wand or no. anything. So if you put the wand out in front of you in your hand, you actually see like a ghost hand, like it's your hand. Yeah. Um, a virtual reality, a, a virtual hand. reality hand. And so at, at one point you have to like pull down a ramp or the story won't go any further. And so you're standing there like, 
What's going on? How do I do this? Yeah, so you need some instructions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can pull open a compartment that reveals a control panel. Yes. With three buttons, you gotta press. And guess which one you had to press? The red button. <laughs> guess which one I instinctively went for? The, the red, red button. button. <laughs> <laughs> now I forget what the what happened. I think you shut down Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, yeah, I, I. I forget what happened too, but you had to then press a whole bunch of series of buttons and the panel went back up. But then... But then... You had to get your lightsaber. Why? Because there was troopers <gasps> coming at you, a right? A shuttle oh, that looms shuttle. right over you yeah. and lands in the distance. And what comes running out of the shuttle? <gasps> Stormtroopers! A legion of stormtroopers and they're firing right at you. It, I've, never, I've never seen lasers come at you just yeah. like this. I mean, it really felt like uh, they were they were going to beam you right in the face and it was just, it was done so well, so photorealistic. It, it was fantastic. Yeah. And it, it, once again, you really feel like you're in the moment. You're holding your lightsaber and it feels like it's you're holding a lightsaber and like you it's the coolest experience to be like swinging this wand around and it's a lightsaber it's lit up it's like lighting up the space around you like electric yeah and but you're using your lightsaber to deflect the yeah, laser bolts yeah then that's what you do so uh yeah you're deflecting the laser bolts and depending on how good you are you can get that laser bolts to deflect right back at the stormtrooper and we're telling you this because they didn't tell us to do this no <laughs> they, no it was if you live in los angeles and you want to go to this experience by all means please go but just know the some of the operators they haven't been on these certain experiences, so they don't know what to do. Yeah. But it's very instinctual that you have oh, a lightsaber, yeah. there's stormtroopers shooting at you, and you start blocking and defending yourself. Well, it's instinctual to us. My yeah. mom, however, <laughs> I watched my mom, and and it's funny because Richard and I both instinctually hold the lightsaber with two hands. Mm. You know, it's easier to control that way. And my mom was like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And it's kind of funny because... Like she's swatting fireflies. Yes. It's kind of funny because you're in these cubicles where... You, anyone can watch you. Anyone can watch and see what you're doing. And then there's a screen where they can see what you're seeing. So I was watching my mom. I even took some video <laughs> and stuff of her hey, you, doing it. You took video of me, right? I did. And oh, I need gotta, to show you we that. We're going to post that. Yeah, we'll post, we'll post the videos on our YouTube channel. So we'll do that. It's really funny. <laughs> so you know what? I could have done 20 minutes of battling those stormtroopers. <gasps> yeah, totally. And then after you battle the stormtroopers, I know you hear Han Solo, but the the credits roll up, but you still it lets you have your lightsaber. So as you're watching the credits, you can be like vroom, 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 and like still still pretend to have fun with yeah, your lightsaber. Only my guy took off my visors before the credits start stopped rolling. Dude, dude, not over. I'm a credit watcher. Yeah. There could be a Marvel type tag at the end. Get put them back on. He's like, oh no, not funny. I want to read the credits. And it looks like the credits are coming down from below you. Yeah. Uh, and goes up into the distance. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a two-story tall credit roll. And I wanted to witness this this experience. Oh, yeah. I wasn't done with it. So, dude, put those back on. <laughs> well, what was cool is we saw Hannah Gillis' name there, which we talked with her on Fangirls Going Rogue. So that was really neat. Dave Filoni's name. name was in there. Yeah. Matt Wood. Pablo mm -hmm. Hidalgo. Yeah. So, like, yeah, hey. I wanted to see these names. <laughs> now, how many times did you get hit by the stormtroopers? Oh, I don't know. I think I think at least a couple. Yeah, because the backpack, like, will zing you. Yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to see how close those laser bolts were going to go, so I got hit quite a few times. <laughs> and I got, that, the, the back vibration kind of felt like a little massage. Oh, funny. <laughs> so, well, so bring it on, troopers. Also, what was funny, Richard, is that you had your lightsaber, and part of the VR helmet has this... Like, oh, to get the sound, you have to have a, it's not wireless. So you have a so you're, wire you're attached to, to your head and it kind of goes up because they have it going up to the ceiling. So it doesn't really hinder you around, but because you're swinging your lightsaber <laughs> around and then you kept hitting it. It was funny. <laughs> nice. Now, what other experiences did we do that day? Okay. So they're at this IMAX VR center. They have different experiences, which can also be multiplayer which is kind of cool. So we did Raising a Ruckus, which was a four-person multiplayer, although this one didn't really wow me so much because 
Unlike trials on Tatooine where you're actually in the story and have to participate for it to unfold, Raising a Ruckus was literally like you're in a movie theater in these D-box seats and you just watch the story unfold around you. You can't you can't really do anything. You don't have a wand. You don't have any controllers. You're just a spectator. But yeah. this one was the least expensive. Yeah. I think each one runs about 10 bucks. Yeah. This it's one 10, was like eight. 10 per person. Uh, yeah. are, so like it was eight per person for Raising Your Ruckus. Yeah. But it, it was a, a, a great little story. Yeah. It was great graphics. I, I enjoyed it. But yeah, it's, it's not a participating experience. Right. And then I know my dad did The Walk which is oh, based yeah. on that movie, The Walk, where a guy walks across a tightrope across these giant, you know, really tall buildings. And so that one was also cheaper because literally... All you, you did was walk. You walk the tightrope. <laughs> and you're in the VR environment, so it looks like you are that far up. But um, and I saw they had like a rope taped to the ground diagonally in, in the... In the cubicle. In the cubicle. And so you just watch dad go back and forth across the rope. <laughs> so I, I was yeah. interested in that one, <laughs> but I went over to the paranormal activity. Yes, you VR did. VR experience. Now, how is that? I, I love being freaked. I, I hate slasher films and gory films. Like They do nothing for me, but a good spook film. Oh, just puts me on edge. And I love those paranormal activity movies. They do just that. Or maybe the first two. In this one, you're actually in the haunted house. Only once again, the the guy who was operating this this experience, he was too freaked to have done it. So <laughs> he didn't really know what I was supposed to do. Oh no. And neither did I. And you're supposed to go around and collect these objects and put them in a, a, a side bag. But the main objective is to get out of the house. Oh. I didn't know that until we were done. Okay. So I said to the guy, are, are we done? What happened? He said, oh, I think you're supposed to leave the house. You, you tell me this now? Just yeah. got mauled by a, 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 this little pixie ghost. You telling me this now? <laughs> but it really was freaky. Those movies are very, very freaky. And you're walking around this, this dark house. You have a flashlight. You're going to go find batteries. And things are start falling on you. And you're, you're, you're hearing voices all around your head. And you hear little children saying, look out, she's here. You better go. It, that puts, you know, when you ever hear those little kid voices or the, you see a tricycle in the distance and the wheel is still spinning or mm. the merry-go-round at the playground going around very slowly, you know, not, nothing good is going to happen from there. Yeah. And, the, and these ghosts just disappear. I don't want to give anything away too much in case you're going to do it, uh, Skywalkers. It, it's, it's fun, but just know what you're supposed to do. Before you go into it. Right. Because I died and didn't know what I was, I was supposed to. I, I could have left like five minutes ago. Right. Well, what's interesting about this experience, and I got to watch, we watched someone else do it, is you have your controller, but unlike Trials on Tatooine, where you're in one spot, in Paranormal Activity, you actually can move around with your controller. So you like point to a certain area, right? And yeah. click a button. And then and that, all of a sudden you're... In that area. Well, you you walk with the controller. Okay. But when you want to walk, what do you do? You move your legs. Right. But you can just stand still and move the controller oh. that walks you. However, when there's a ghost chasing you, you want to move your legs. Yeah. And the guys did say he's seen a lot of people run into walls. <laughs> Whenever I had a question, I asked him. I could hear him like right next to me. Right. I know. I know he was there to protect people from running into walls. Because once again, you hear a ghost at your back, you're out of there. You're gonna go down those flight of stairs. You're gonna you're gonna go and walk the buildings. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you're gonna run to Tatooine. Yeah, and what's interesting is in these experiences they set up like your space and so if you walk too far you'll see like this grid come up right and so you know oh but i should back up when you're running from ghosts well, yes. you don't see that grid until it's too late right right but i'm saying like trials on tatooine it was easy to see that grid yeah. and be like oh i'm going well, too far with trials on tatooine you're you're just standing there there's yeah. no reason to move right except moving the lightsaber but mm -hmm. once again you're in a haunted house you're hearing children cry you're seeing you're hearing the squeak of a tricycle wheel yeah, you want to get out of that house really quickly. Heck no. And mm -mm. that front door was like right next to me too. Dude, tell me these things. Wow. <laughs> All right. So then I think our final multiplayer experience, that was my second favorite beyond Trials on Tatooine. Oh, one more thing about oh, yes. the paranormal activity. Sorry. It's fun just to go there and watch others do it. Yes. Because it really is freaky. Yeah. Yeah, what, in fact. What, one girl screamed. Yeah, she screamed there was some bloody screaming. murder. She was cowering on the ground. So... 
yeah, once again, the, the freak factor is like at an 11. Yeah, so actually, this is what I would recommend because when I was setting up times, they, they said that you were going to pod, so I thought you would be enclosed. Right. And so I scheduled everyone at the same times for things, but what I would do next time is actually schedule one individual at a certain time, another, so that everyone can watch. That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. And even you can even record them as they're playing. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. Like you can just wander around backstage and and record people. It's really yeah, fun. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. So so yeah, I would even like, I I set so many experiences for us, but I think looking back, I would just have everyone do kind of, you know, similar ones. So okay. <laughs> so the experience A plus, customer service. B minus. Yeah, depending on the guy. Yeah, they just got to know what they're getting into. Some of them were really good, and some of them were like, here, here, here you go. Okay, go. Yeah. And now <laughs> let me take this off before the credits have uh, finished rolling. Yeah. Dude, I'm going to backhand you so hard. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Patrick Izzo has Hello, joined Patrick us. Patrick Izzo. Hey, stay tuned, Patrick Izzo. I'm going to give you a big shout out in a few minutes. Okay. Oh, so then. Yes. Then. All right. Then, then, our Father's Day adventure oh, no, continued. No, no, no. Oh, what? I'm sorry. We had one more thing at the VR oh, experience. Oh, we did, didn't My we? second favorite one was the Eagle Flight multiplayer. Oh, that was so much multiplayer. fun. That was so much fun. So what this is, is my dad, Richard, you, and I, we all went to do this multiplayer. And what, it's like a, it's like this game. So it's like a video game, but with virtual reality. So we all, once again, put on our virtual reality headsets, our headphones, and then you sat in a chair which had the backpack on it so that like if you're sitting in the chair you can feel uh, what's happening. And these chairs didn't move like D-Box seats. But what you did was you were controlling an eagle that was flying around Paris. And it was basically a game of capture the flag, <laughs> only it was capture the bunnies. <laughs> ah! So you had a game controller in your hand, like like your typical Xbox game controller, and certain things you control with the motion of your head, like if you tilt your head with your ear to your right shoulder, you would veer right, and if you tilt your head with your ear to your left shoulder, you would veer left in the game as you fly, and then if you wanted to go faster, you'd press the controller, or slower, you'd press the controller, and you'd also press the controller to let out a an eagle screech, which um, knocked the other player, like the bunny from the other player, if they had it. So the whole object was to get that bunny first and bring it to a certain location uh, before the other team could. So dad, you or yeah, Richard, you and dad were on one team right. against me. Yeah, because you, you always win. I'm so. more the gamer. Yeah. yeah. We got to double our odds. Yeah, it was fun. And so, yeah, I won the first game. Yeah, of course you did. Of course you did. Because <laughs> I found that spiraling, instead of flying over the city, you could fly through the building and then stuff, and then they couldn't get me with a screech. So <laughs> so I would fly through the buildings and then get to, yeah. uh, but then sometimes I'd splat myself against the wall of a building and die. Honestly, I never really tried most of the time. I just wanted to fly and feel the wind beneath my wings. Really? Yep. Oh, so that must have been dad. <laughs> dad screeching I, I, me. I, yeah, I let him down. I let him down. But it was super fun. Like, did you guys enjoy oh, I, it? Oh, yeah. You get to save bunnies. Yeah. Best game ever. It was really neat. And uh, unfortunately, though, after that one, I had done, that was like my third or fourth VR experience. And I would kind of felt a little woozy yeah so yeah. just be aware that you could it could mess with your equilibrium a little bit if you're susceptible that's to that. why we we stood to the side and watched those girls play the paranormal activity experience yes that was fun that was <laughs> help me get my my uh All footing right. there yeah so so what else did we do on our adventurous day extravaganza father's day 2017 okay well at griffith park only the third sundays of each month Walt's barn is open. And so Father's Day happened to be the third Sunday of the month. And Walt's barn is open to people. It's free. And this is the actual barn where Walt Disney had on Carrollwood Drive. In Holmby Hills, which yes. is a little suburb in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's like totally restored. They have his desk there. They have his washer, washroom. They have his... His mirror. He used to shave. His, his shaving set. They yeah. have like his shaving set and mirror and stuff. And then a whole bunch of... Well, they have a train. 
Yeah. There, which you can ride. Yeah. But within the barn. They, yeah. Now, they didn't the recreate this barn. Mm-hmm. They lifted it up from Holmby Hills and moved it very gently to Griffith Park here in Los Angeles and set it down and made sure it was all structurally sound and yep. cemented into the ground. So this was the actual barn. Now, the barn isn't that huge. Right. But it's it's a, a nice little workspace that you can see Walt in. Yeah. And here's a tip. Get there early. Yes. Because we waited about five minutes and got into the barn because they only let a certain amount of people in because it is kind of small. And like any time later in that day, there was this line wrapping around the barn. And it opens at 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. At 11.15, you have like celebration lines. Yes, people yes. People are cutting each other. People are fighting. Oh, hold on. I was flashing back. They weren't fighting at all. <laughs> it's Disney. They weren't fighting. Yeah. And when you walk into Walt's barn, who do you see? <gasps> Margaret Carey. Our fairy pod mother right there ready with open arms. And she took us on a little personal tour of the barn, showed us the desk where Walt used to sit. I was so excited that she got to meet my parents because she totally reminds me of my grandma. So like seeing her and my mom together was so cute. And oh, I just (laughs) loved it. Yeah. And there's uh, memorabilia from, from Walt's personal collection. Yeah. And a lot of stuff that's just sitting there. Like, oh, I hope someone's watching this stuff because this is <laughs> this is invaluable and people can just walk off with it. And it luckily, you know, no, oh, one, no, no one, one ever does. has. No. Right. They have enough volunteers in there. Right. Now, there's a couple of different things in Walt's barn that says, please touch. Oh. Okay. Like the SOS machine, not SOS machine. The telegraph. Thank you. Telegraph machine. Yeah. Big red button that says, please touch. Guess what I did? I didn't touch it. <gasps> yes, you did. Well, uh, I did, but <laughs> only if it said, please don't touch what I want to touch it. Exactly. They had, they had a train that went around the area that mm-hmm. some of the track that was used came from the Holmby Hills estate. Yeah. Some of the train pieces came from Walt's personal collection. And the train, I'm sure you've seen footage of him going around his compound on his little tiny train, like like, like a little kid on his train. You know what, Walt? You work, you work very hard. Have something that brings so much fun and, and, and enjoyment to your life. And the, tri- the trip itself was like 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. You get to see these little tiny uh, recreations of towns and just the, the cutest thing ever. Yeah. And it's, it's very low tech, which I really liked. You didn't have animatronics. It's, you didn't have digital photography. It's kind of like storybook ca- canal boats. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. On a train. Yeah. You know, so you visit different areas, and it's a long ride. It's really fun. You kind of go around the whole place twice. Yes, but do the the barn first before yes. we hit the train, and it's free. Free to get in. Yeah, the train is not free. The train the f- is three dollars. Three dollars a free. ride. All right. Yeah, yeah. To get into Walt's barn itself is free. Yes. You have a little donation bucket there. You throw like five, ten bucks in there. Oh yeah. Because this is all volunteer run. Well, it's operated by the nonprofit Carolwood Foundation, and so. But the you staff, know, the staff there that day, they're oh, all they're all volunteers. Completely volunteers. Yes. So it's it's really, really neat. Yeah. And what was even more neat, sometimes you'll see some passing familiar faces. Yes, including ride designer and Imagineer Bob Gurr. What? I know. He's just walking around. It was amazing. So we, we, we cornered him. Well, yeah. Now, we should mention that he's worked on Autopia, Haunted Mansion, the Matterhorn, and the Monorail. Like... It, amazing. So this guy knows his stuff. So we said, hey, Mr. Gurr, would you mind if we spoke with you for a couple of minutes uh, for our podcast, Sky Walking Through Neverland? He's like 86 years old. He's like bouncing all over the place. Oh, sure. Come on. Lead me in. Here we go. Let's have some fun with this. It's like, <laughs> okay. So this is our really fun interview with the legendary Bob Gurr. All right. So give me a lead. So here we are with Mr. Bob Gurr. I'm sorry, the legendary Bob Gurr. And now we are here at Walt's Barn. So what kind of history do you have over here with Walt's Barn? Well, I'm on the Board of Governors, and today being the third Sunday of every month, I run a tour called Bob Gurr's um, Walt Disney History Trail, and we have a bus with 40 people on it. So we have a five hours that we show people all of Walt's early life uh, and he grew up in this area, and I grew up in this area. So there's two lives together that we share and understand. It's all about Walt, not so much the company. And then in the middle of the day, we stop at the barn here for about an hour and 40 minutes. 
Now we continue on over to WDI, over to the studio, but we did start at Walt Disney and, and Roy's original house. The two of those guys built from a kit they ordered that came in a big truck and put it together. We go to where, where the Hyperion studio was, we go to the Merry yeah. Ground, and we ride the Merry Ground and tell stories of how Walt had the inspiration on a park, park bench right next to the Merry Ground. Oh my gosh, how do we so, take this tour? That sounds amazing. Go to, go to waltland.com. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good long tour. We, this is the 10th one. We started one and the people won't stop signing up for it. So I'm retired. I'm 86 and I have to work Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the memory that really means the most to you when it comes to Walt Disney? The fact that Walt's ideas really worked and the whole world understood it. And it has continued forever. Simple as that. And being here at Walt's barn, what, what piece of memorabilia do you think, if Walt were here now, he'd go, oh, I remember this, and would really strike a chord with him? He would remember everything. He was interested in everything, total curiosity about everything. Uh, that barn over there, he built a lot of the furniture himself. Those are his personal tools in there. He was always thinking of stuff, paying attention to stuff. He was a quick read on anything that was uh, of a scientific or mechanical nature to help tell stories better with. What I mean, is that was such a so interesting? Yeah. What is what is the favorite thing that you have worked on in your life? Uh, only about two hundred and fifty projects in forty five years. <laughs> so you can't pick. What was number fourteen? Number fourteen would have been uh, somewhere in early nineteen fifty six, spring of fifty six. <laughs> yeah, wow. back in there. And there were so many projects, just one after another. Was there ever a project that just didn't make it from? the concept to the actual reality? No, usually those are uh, story ideas that never got much out of the story writing stage. You'd have a great idea, and the more you'd look at it in words, it wasn't going to work. Uh, Walt never really committed the company to doing something that was not going to work. It was very seldom that ever happened. But after he, after he passed away, there were infamous things that don't work, like we had a perfectly good people mover, and then... The modern day people replaced it with rocket rods, so how long did they last? Right, right. Like two well, years. Two, two years, yeah. So there's a difference between the thinking of the people around Walt and modern trained people today. Sometimes they don't quite see the things that, sure, it may sound cool, but is it really going to be a benefit and it will actually work? Yeah. Is there anything. Yeah, is there any ride or anything nowadays, like at Disneyland, that has really impressed you, that you have not worked on? You didn't ask me about Harry Potter. <laughs> well, that too. You know what? Harry Potter too. I, I guess I included all of that. Well, the original Harry Potter uh, Wizarding World in Florida, and then that was followed uh, a few years ago by the Diagon Alley. Uh, it's now followed with uh, Universal Hollywood uh, with the Wizarding World here. Uh, it is by far the best total attraction from the queue line, the theming, uh, the attraction itself, the action that you experience and you see. It's one of the few attractions that you're so drawn deep into the following the kids with the broom and all the crazy places <laughs> that it is one attraction partway through. You are hoping it's going to end soon. <laughs> It's so encompassing. Now, the reason I say that is I, uh, I had a tour about a month ago, 6 o'clock in the morning with the head of maintenance, showed me everything in the entire attraction, everything. The maintenance areas, the ride vehicles, all the show action equipment, the thoroughness of which it's done. And the th key thing I really remember is when you have a queue line and you have artifacts for display, typically if the guests can't see it, you don't put it behind a sight line. J.K. Rowling is so thorough. Because it exists, it's going to be in the attraction. They took me to places in the queue line where I'd go over the chain, walk around behind a corner, and maybe five feet past the sight line, it is decorated just as thorough as what the guests would see. Now that is what I call the doing it right the way Walt Disney did it. So yes, you asked me the, um, the right question for the wrong park. That's okay. <laughs> well, you know what, speaking of which, what do you hope to see out of Star Wars Land? And what, do you think they're going to give it the Bob Gurr touch? I mean, well, considering that Scott Trowbridge, who worked on Harry Potter and Diagon Alley, is also now involved with Star Wars Land, do you feel like it's going to be pretty good? 
I like Walt Disney's Disneyland. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, so you're, you're, not, you're not really in for the modernization no, and the intellectual got, properties of others? No, you, got, you got to remember, what was Walt Disney's Disneyland? It was always going to change, but it was going to stay true to Walt's America, the Americana, the, the true stories. Today, when you can walk in Disneyland and you see the incongruity of a stormtrooper and a Mickey Mouse and a Donald <laughs> Duck, um, remember, John Hinch and Walt always talked about no incongruities of stories. In other words, there were no jarring moments. I like it when it has no jarring moments. Okay. Right. If they were to give it the Bob Gurr touch for Star Wars Land, what, if they came to you and said, Mr. Gurr, what could we do to make this more toward what you, you've done for Disneyland? What would you suggest that they do? Put it in another park. <laughs> There you go. All How right. do you top that one? All right, thank you. For Thanks. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I was so excited that we got to ask him about Star Wars Land. Yeah. <laughs> Even though his answer was not our answer, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, you know what? It was a good answer. Yeah. And maybe Disney should listen to his answer. Mm. Yeah. Let's maybe put it in another park in Long Beach. <laughs> I'm all for that. So thank you, Mr. Bob Gurr, for being so so approachable, so friendly, and just so upbeat at 86 years old. Mm -hmm. Goodness gracious. All right. With that, let's journey through the Clone Wars micro series volume two with our Skywalking Through Neverland book reviewer, Jocasta Drew Kaplan, and Skywalker Nitsan Harrell. The Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen. Begun. The Clone War has. The Clone Wars are a major event in the history of the Star Wars universe. And uh, obviously because it's a war, there's a lot of action and a lot of adventure and a lot of things going on. But in the films, we don't really get to deal with that very much. We kind of start the Clone War in one episode, we end it in the next episode, but we never actually see the war. Um, and so uh, by doing the animated series, it was a great opportunity to fill in some of the blanks in the middle where you get to deal with the adventures of the war and all the things that went on during the war because obviously that's a very fertile ground for exciting storytelling. Like fire across the galaxy, the Clone War spread. In league with the wicked Count Dooku, more and more planets slip. On episode 169, we reviewed volume one of the Clone Wars micro series from 2003. Once again, to avoid any confusion, this is not the Dave Filoni series, The Clone Wars, but just simply Clone Wars. Now we are back to review season two, which ran in 2004. So here with us once again is our Skywalking Through Neverland book reviewer, Joe Costa Drew Kaplan. Hello, Drew. Hey, hey, how's it going? We are good. And also joining us is Skywalker Nitsan Harrell. Hey, guys. Hey, hey, you two. So you're ready to talk Clone Wars Volume 2? Let's do this. Absolutely. Yeah. This doesn't run in seasons, just volumes. Yeah. Mm. Well, it did run in seasons when I was on the air, but for DVD purposes, which everyone will, will have seen, right. it's, it's volume, so we'll go with volumes. Yeah. Now, did this come out, again, refresh my memory, on YouTube? No, this came out no. on Cartoon Network. Okay, because there is no, was, or... There was a YouTube. Okay. It just wasn't YouTube. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or was there? Really? When did YouTube it, I don't come think out? YouTube was 2005, in 2005, 2006. Oh, I remember when I was living in Hollywood that I was watching stuff on YouTube. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So, once again, <laughs> volume two of Clone Wars. All right, Drew, take us through a summary of this 30 minute season volume. Yes. So, there are primarily five different battles, scenes that we see. Uh, and we start off exactly where season one left off where Anakin is giving chase to this successful fighter pilot and all the way leaving Munalis against Obi-Wan's orders and all the way onto Yavin 4. Find, and he uh, ultimately duels Ventress, being successful, but at what cost? I'm going to make you pay for what you've done. Come, Padawan. Your fall will be my ascension to the sea. The next is we see Mace Windu battling on Dantooine doing... 
what I can only extra- describe as amazing fighting awesomeness. <laughs> then we see Luminara and Dooley showing her Padawan Barris Ophi how to construct her lightsaber wind. The temple on Ilum comes under attack from chameleon droids. You have taught me well, Master Luminara. Barris Ophi, your training is complete. Something trespasses on sacred ground. The temple is breached. Yoda helps out and is able to save Unduli and Ophi, but the temple is nevertheless destroyed. Finally, we have the conclusion of the Battle of Munilis coming to a close with the Republic forces winning. But, however, we hear this distressing message coming in to General Kenobi. General Kenobi! General Kenobi! Yes, Master Beric. Need immediate evac from planet Harpori. New droid general. He's unstoppable and giving the Jedi the battle for their lives. Mm. Right. So, Sarah, how does this volume differ from the first volume? Well, I think, okay, so the first volume, you're kind of figuring out what's happening. You're you're dumped in the middle of a battle, right? And also, it's a little jarring the the overall look of the whole series. Like, it's totally different from what you know from the cl- from the Clone Wars and also from the live action movies right. as well. Or this has so, such a definitive 2D look. It does. And so now knowing what to expect, I for volume 2, I got right into the story. Like the stories were very very good. There's even some humor in there. <laughs> yeah, in in these five battles, you really see what's going on. You really see the scale of the war. And I was drawn into the story and Padme's outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Snow bunny Padme. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Nitsan, you were really hooked onto the look last time. And yeah. You weren't too crazy about it at first, but it grew on you. Yeah. I definitely have adapted to seeing this in terms of the colors and the visual scape and the 2D-ness of it, like you mentioned. Also, there's a lot more, I've noticed this time, a lot more texture. Um, even in little things, like when you zoom into a planet, like it looks almost chalky. Like there's like a mist that's created almost like there's depth. There is, there's something to it that I didn't notice before, but the more you look at it, the more it comes out at you. Also, there were very small moments where, especially when Anakin and Ventress are having, having their battle in the cityscape where there's more effects and more like moments of, um, almost like special effects looking things that I, I didn't even really pay attention to as much earlier, but it was really impressive this time seeing like where it came from and where it went after this. Nice. Now, Drew, the first volume I felt really focused on the war aspect. There's a lot of battling going on here, but I thought we got more into character. Yeah, we get to see a little bit more, certainly from the Ilum scene, as well as obviously the interplay between Obi Wan and um, I'm, I'm breaking up. I'm breaking up Anakin. <laughs> um, so that was, <laughs> so that Master, was... I can't hear you. What'd you say? <laughs> right. We're going through a tunnel. <laughs> Anakin, do you hear me? Do not follow that ship. That is an order. Anakin! Sorry, sir. Your signal is breaking up. Padawan, if you. <laughs> So that, that was pretty interesting. It wasn't just the battles like we had seen with Kit Fisto and some of the other ones in the, in the first season. Or like some of the, yeah, in the first season you had that one episode with absolutely no talking right. and no music. Yeah. You just right. had the clones. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's, the with ARC Troopers. Yeah, right, on the Arc Troopers. Well, here we have kind of the same thing going on with Dentuin because the only dialogue going on at all mm. is voiced by the droids where they mm-hmm. say, you know, Roger, Roger, we've got to get the thing ready for the next uh, oh, thing. That's right. But yeah. there's no, the clones and uh, Mace Windu have no dialogue. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that the story arcs are longer. Yes. So whereas mm-hmm. in the first like segment of episodes, they kind of switch off a lot more um, frequently. Lot frequently, yes, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Um, and now you get to build the characters, like you're saying, because the stories are longer. Yeah. We get to see them and meet them and like see their sense of humor or their like aggressiveness or their different relationships. Really, yeah, I definitely think relationships are built in this where we didn't get that so much before. Right, Richard. What are your overall thoughts? Oh, I love the fact that we do go more into the character, like I was just saying. And maybe it's just because at this point we know more about the characters. More novels have come out. 
more comics have come out, so we know more about Mace Windu and Barazafi and Luminara Unduli. So maybe that had a lot to play with it, because uh, a novel had just come out in 2002 that introduced Barris Afi mm. and, right before oh. Attack of the Clones. Then we saw her Attack of the Clones, then we saw her here. Oh, wow. wow. So we had been building up the characters. This was back when there was a new novel coming out every 15 hours. <laughs> so you're bound to meet all these characters <laughs> at some point sooner or later. So I do love that, and I love the fact that we have a lot of callbacks. Hmm. Like that very first chapter, we hear... Anakin slash Darth Vader's famous line. Ah. I have you now. I have you now. And we get to visit Yavin 4. Yes. Which I really loved. You see the temples in the back. You, you see the, the, the jungle, which we never see in the films mm. because we're so busy in the base. But now here is Anakin chasing Ventress up and down the trees. And we get to see the vines and really feel the humidity of this jungle planet. <laughs> yeah. So I love the fact that we get to get to see stuff that we've seen before, but not so much in depth. Did you get the Tarzan feeling from that part? <laughs> yes! I totally have this written. Tarzan, right here. Me too, right here. Oh my gosh. Any Tarzan. Yes. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's awesome. And another callback. Well, I wouldn't really call this a callback, more a call forward, some foreshadowing. What did you think Anakin's ship looked like as he's chasing around a Asajj Ventress in outer space? Oh, dude, Ahsoka. I know. Oh, wow. It was totally it, Ahsoka colors. Yeah, there was one shot where the ship flies by the camera. Yep. And it's like, what? Did, did we just see Ahsoka? Yes. <laughs> and then it was flying around some more. It's like, oh, it's the same color scheming as her, her, her Leku. Yes. Oh, yeah. With yeah. the blue and the white. Right. Oh, and then wow. mixed with sun, this reddish, brown, tannish, brownish, like her tunic. So yeah. So I don't know if Dave Filoni saw that and said, you know, that's a that's a that's a good basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's go from there. Yeah, it was really interesting, like that part. Now the chapter on Dan Tween, which another callback. Yeah. Hey, this is our first time seeing Dan Tween, which I was I was really excited about. This is the episode where Mace Windu single handedly wipes out <laughs> legions and legions of battle droid super battle droids. Yeah. yeah. Which was just amazing. And we have this character named Paxi Silo. That's the little boy oh. who looks like Luke from the cutscenes in Star Wars. Yeah, it does. He has the tunic and the little hat, and he's <laughs> watching this whole thing. Yeah. Now, there's different schools of thought on this episode where a lot of fans, when this aired on Cartoon Network, said, Now, wait a minute. Mace Windu is going to wipe out all of these super battle droids. It's a little, little too much, <laughs> a little too unrealistic. Yeah. Especially since he's not yelling something MFers. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the pulp fiction oh, the pulp okay. fiction version. <laughs> but but there was I, I I wish I remembered where I read this, but it was said that it was taken from this little boy Paxi's point of view. Oh. So you know how a, a little kid may see something, but what's going on in his head right. may not be what's going on in real life. He heightens it. Yeah. yeah. So May, may have been fighting two droids, but this kid living on Dantooine kind of had an Ezra Bridger feeling of living alone. He needed some entertainment. He built it up in his head. Right. Yeah. But then cut into Leland Shi, who said, well, wait a minute. We've seen what what the Force can do in The Empire Strikes Back and Attack of the Clones, where you can, you can just throw things around. But yeah. Leland, come on. <laughs> Throwing a <laughs> piece of, of metal or piece of the ceiling is a little different than wiping out thousands of super battle droids by just wiping your, your hand and giving it a force push. But yeah. you also have to take into account that this series is animated, and so you can kind of do what you want with animation. Well, that's that's very true, but you got to keep it within the context of what we know to be true. And, of course, you can broaden that out, but having him just force push literally, like... 55 rows deep <laughs> of super battle droids. That was pretty awesome. I know when I, when I first saw this, I thought, eh, it's fun to watch, but really? What I don't know. It's for really me it was, fun to watch. <laughs> it is really fun to watch. For me, it was a completely believable. I don't know. It, <laughs> I, I could totally see Window do, Mace Window doing this because he is this like hardcore Jedi. He's like one of the best. Mm-hmm. And there's that moment where he takes apart the droid to the bolt. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is epic. It's like Matrix. He's like expanding this droid until it falls. It's, it's 
so good. And the, I mean, the graphics in that were just like detailed, which we don't see so much in the show. But this was like the detail to get that moment, to get that point across that like he's so powerful. And yeah. I also have something to add to that is in these scenes where Mace is taking out these droids and the, the beats of the music kind of go with the cuts of what we're seeing. It's, it was like a dance. It mm. seriously was. It was like choreography that we were seeing. And now maybe it's just because we're just watching So You Think You Can Dance. But <laughs> I totally had that. Kind of, it, it just seemed like a whole dance to me, and especially this particular battle. Uh, there's some moments in the very beginning of it that with the explosion and the music and the beats and the, another explosion and then bam. It's neat. Can I ask what that um, machine was that the droids were operating? I've never, I, yeah. I don't recognize that. Yeah, it was like a planet puncher. Yeah, is it something? Not, is it familiar? I'm not sure no. what the purpose was. It just okay. hovered above the planet. And just every once in a while, would punch down, well, creating big well, craters. It's, it's disruptive yeah, it's to, to make, the battle. Yeah, create well, craters. Right. Yeah. I'm sure it had a, had a function, but yeah, like we, you were yeah. saying, we've never seen it, and it was creating craters. So I'm sure it had some kind of a a mining function. You know what it was? Hmm. It's like Man of Steel. Moving right Those along. Stupid mines. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Mine ships. Yeah, okay. With the world building Edit. whatever ships. <laughs> oh. You talk about Man of Steel, let me just got to move I on. Know. I know. Um, also, I wanted to say about that planet, it reminded, there was something very Kansas-y about it. <laughs> like the wheat fields. I'm not with the Man of Steel. And, no, I wasn't actually going for that. I was going more for like the Dorothy kind of thing. Yeah. Like very like we're not in Kansas anymore kind of feeling. But um the when the kid, I don't remember what you said his name was. Paxi Silo. Paxi, when he is walking and like it's just very something very ethereal, like earthly on it. Um that like harkens back to like very visual like planet Earth. Okay. So I, I don't know. Something interesting about it. What's well, funny, you're, Sarah, you're getting Man of Steel. Nitsan is getting Wizard of Oz. I got Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> nice. <laughs> What'd you get, Drew? No, it does seem Midwestern because of the field, the flatness of the field. Yeah, and those yeah. high corn stalks. Yeah. Now, in the Barris and Luminara episode where Barris is putting together her lightsaber as Luminara is saying this Jedi poem. Mm. Now, listen to this and tell me what you get from this. The crystal is the heart of the blade. The heart is the crystal of the Jedi. The Jedi is the crystal of the Force. The Force is the blade of the heart. It was my favorite part. <laughs> like, that scene of... Of uh, Barris putting together her lightsaber, maybe because I I love those scenes also in the Clone Wars, but right. I I think it's such an emotional moment. It's such a like it's it's a milestone in a Jedi's life when you put together your lightsaber. Coming and of age, it, exactly. It's a coming of age moment. And for me, I mean, I know Barris from the Clone Wars as the person who in the end ends up betraying Ahsoka. But Ooh. I know, but for Spoiler. but seeing her. <laughs> But seeing her at this point in, in her life when she is just learning and she's still a Padawan, like a younger Padawan, she's coming of age, she's getting trained. And in the part where they're fighting the the droids, she's amazing. Like she really is so skilled, even at that young stage. Mm-hmm. Sarah, what did you get from that that poem, that mantra? Honestly, while that poem was going on, I was trying to remember, wait, what are their names? <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was saying that everything is connected. Just like Ben Kenobi told Luke in Star Wars, mm. the Force is what gives the Jedi power. It's an energy field created by all living things. And for me, it was a retelling of that, hmm. of that of the ways of the Force. Yeah. This way, it was saying everything is all connected from you to your lightsaber. You're all one. Actually, yeah. what is the last line in that? The force is the blade of the heart. Okay, that's interesting because the heart is in there, mm-hmm. which Jedi are supposed to not be tied to their emotions, and yet by using the word heart... But they have passion. Right. But to me, that that almost feels like you must be connected to your emotions to be a Jedi. Well, it's not saying that you you should have any kind of connection just because, because you have a heart. It just means that you care. Okay. Just like Anakin and Padme were talking about in Attack of the Clones. You just can't have that, that connection. But they are 
encouraged to love. Right, mm. right, but just not be just attachment. Not, love. Exactly, right. Okay. I f- I found it interesting the connection. Now it's very Jedi centric, right? Because they connect Jedi to the Force. But where does it leave the dark side or even non dark or light? Oh, side they have users? no no rules. They're 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 outlaw. Right. So it's very Jedi centric, is what I'm saying. Like the Jedi and the Force being very connected. So that's that was my take on the poem. Okay. That is yeah. very Jedi. Very Jedi centric. It's it's very from the Jedi cent- support point of view. Okay. As opposed to saying, you know, we connected it this way. The dark side users connected it to the Force in this way. Right. Because they have dark. They have light side. They have lightsabers as well. I really enjoyed that episode as well because, like that that arc, because Yoda's there and he is hilarious, especially <laughs> when he's uh, forcing Padme's. Um, Kaifo. Kaifo when he's Kaifo. forcing him to, to agree to, 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 to go to the planet. I, I couldn't. It was just the humor in that was, was very good. <laughs> Our only hope to rescue Jedi. To Ilum, we must go now. This is not a rescue ship. May I remind our master Jedi we have a more pressing mission. A slight detour. Jeopardize the mission. It will not. A slight detour. Jeopardize the mission. It will not. You will take us to Ilum. You'll take us to Ilum. You will not pass any seagulls. You will not pass any seagulls. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I found funny is the fact that they were Padme and Typho and, and, and Yoda were already on their way somewhere. And then they take this detour to go to Ilum, which is a very snowy planet. And Padme had the perfect outfit. For this snowy world. Did you not I, see Phantom Menace? <laughs> can we can we discuss this outfit yes. for a minute? Okay. Snow Bunny Padme. Yes. Sure. Let's talk a lot about this. <laughs> um it was it was really cool. It yeah. was like so out there, but like fashion and like practical mm-hmm. and like she's not like, oh, I'm gonna go on a snowy planet, but I'm gonna wear the same thing I was wearing before. I'm gonna be practical about this and put something warm on. Right. Like which is just and yet still look amazing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, it's fun to see cosplayers at conventions yes. dressed as characters from Clone Wars, wow. especially the Padme bunnies. Well, you know, what? I have... <laughs> the snow bunnies. I have a story about this. Oh, because please. the very first time I saw this outfit, because I, once again, have not seen this series until now, uh, was at the Los Angeles convention... Uh, Kamikaze? Star Wars, Star Wars Celebration Four. Okay. And so this was before I was cosplaying at all, and before any of that. And I remember we walked in that first day when we did the full day, and I saw this outfit. I'm like, "What? What is that?" And you explained to me what it was from, and I had no <laughs> idea what you were talking about. I just thought it was really cute, and I think it was that moment that, like, huh? I think I want to cosplay. Oh, so. <laughs> Uh, like thinking back, I think that was one of my turning points in wanting to. Uh, well, if there's a Los Angeles-based Padme Snow Bunny cosplayer out there, yeah. I thank you. Or someone who <laughs> dressed as that at Star Wars Celebration Four. Yeah. yeah, I do recall seeing a lot of those at Kamikaze. Okay. And mm. well, I guess that being but in that was November. After. Yeah, yeah, that makes more warm. sense. Yeah, but it's cute because it's a white. Outfit yeah. that's very form fitting, and yet she's got this awesome white cape with the fur around it, with blue um, underneath. What All is right. that blue lining? Like, lining. lining. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. But let's let's be practical. There was the wind chill factor had to be at least a hundred below. <laughs> yes. And she's wearing a little shawl. As oh, amazing no, as, as she cape. looked, it looked like she was wearing a substantial yeah. cape. Yes. And Did you see her, how fast those, those winds were well, blowing? Well, and she had her head covered, and when she took off her cape, she still had, like, a head covering. And that's the most important part. you got to cover yeah. your head. Yeah. Even 3PO said, why are you wearing such a, a thin well, nylon on okay, your head? Okay, you're talking about Padme, <laughs> but Yoda yeah. did not have any shoes on. <laughs> and we know that because he saw his little footprints, his little three-toed footprints in the snow. I'm like, Yoda, yeah, put some shoes on. <laughs> well, he's got a little force shield underneath there. <laughs> I, I, I asked Pablo. He said yes. I don't think he did. <laughs> <laughs> now this uh, series caused a lot. Oh, oh, go oh. on. I, one thing that was really cool to me about Ilum was seeing the construction of the lightsabers. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, because that had never been shown on screen before, and ah. and so it was neat to see how they made it. How come more people don't have it? And it seemed to be that it was something requiring the Force, especially with the the Kyber crystals involved. So that was really neat as 
as a fan, I guess, to see that that taking place, that coming yeah. together. We yeah, all- so you saw this originally when yes. it came out. Is yeah. that one of the main things that stuck out to you when seeing it? I mean, from this season, yeah. This one, yeah. Yeah, certainly from this season, because that had, how did they come about? You yeah. Know? So we Absolutely. really get to see it coming together. Don't forget, we almost saw it in Return of the Jedi, in that cut scene where Luke is in Obi-Wan's house, and he's building his lightsaber. But it's a huh. cut scene. But it was cut. And they showed it at Celebration, I think five, five or six in Orlando. You can now see it on the on the Blu-ray DVD. Huh. He's in Obi Wan's cave in in his house, and he's putting together his new lightsaber, and he goes, "All goes, all comes together." Oh wow! I'll check it out. Also about lightsabers is the lightsabers in the rain. <laughs> oh, oh yeah! yeah. Can we, yes. yeah, for just a minute, like. I don't remember seeing this before so much, like the hissing yeah. of the the, when the water. Hit yeah, the blade. Kss. The kss. it was just very like visually. I mean, I could totally see it happening. It makes sense because it's like fire. It's like heat. It makes sense. Uh, you're right. I mean, we do see an attack of the clones when they're on. Um, when oh, he's fighting Jango yeah. Fett, it is rainy, but it, there's not the same effects as we do. Yeah, see Yeah, this was yeah. like done really well. You can see steam coming off it. It makes the battle like and that moment before the battle so much more like dramatic because of that like that hissing there's so much anger coming off of those lightsabers because yeah. of the rain hitting yeah. it and sparking and, pss, pss. and and then that the way that arc ends with anakin and ventress and anakin looking very very evil <laughs> that mm-hmm. the very oh, the end dark side was definitely coming out in yeah. him yeah. because well spoiler alert he kills ventress for the first time yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> the first time. Out of a couple of more times that she'll die, she's like shock tea. It's like, are you ever gonna die? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, we see the lighting first change with him in the trees. Yeah, there's this very intentional shift yes. for shading on him, mm-hmm. and then of course it gets in more intensified it's, once they're under that red planet or moon or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The lighting for that reminds me of Gaston in Beauty and the Beast, the uh-huh. animated version. Because uh-huh. if you if you watch Beauty and the Beast. Over the course of the movie, by the end, by his battle with the beast, his shadows on his face are so <laughs> deep and dark, and it's like, whoa, and that's exactly what happens. All very symbolic going this. to the dark side. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. after Ventress goes over the edge, we, 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 we hold on Anakin for a few moments. Yeah. You can see the, he's, he's struggling. He's struggling. What, what just happened? Mm-hmm. And I, he's sensing that dark side, and it just yeah. comes out in this loud, animalistic scream. Ah! He almost looks like he has fangs. Ooh. As he's tilting his head back. It's like, ooh, Anakin just spotted some fangs. Wow. Okay, so what was up with the moment? Was it before or right after that where he sees a vision of like Yoda and Obi-Wan and flashes of It was while he was screaming, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. While he's really going crazy on uh, Asajj. That's it. Yeah, the, he's seeing images of Qui-Gon as flashes of Yoda and, and Ben Kenobi. Right. Those are them reaching out to the Force, kind of like the way in Attack of the Clones when Anakin was killing the Tusken Raiders. Okay. Yoda was meditating and he heard Qui Gon saying, "Anakin, Anakin." Anakin. He heard, "No." No. All being connected through the Force. Okay. Feeling, oh boy, this is. So was that Anakin seeing them, or was that them sensing Anakin's distress? It was everyone being connected. So everyone sensing everyone else. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. There was something visually about that that scene where Anna is fine, fighting Ventress that took me back to the scene where Vader is fighting Ahsoka in mm. Rebels. Yeah. Um, the of the Apprentice. In the, yeah. There's something in there, um, maybe because they're fighting in the temple. I don't know. It mm. visually took me back there to that episode. And I was mm. like, there's, there's, I wonder if the, well, they definitely watched it, but like <laughs> they took pieces from that and put it in there there's the part where they're in the hall and even though they're in water which by the way was really cool the scene where they're the lightsaber fight is in the water and the mm-hmm. pools of, of water are um kind of moving as they are into yeah. the rebel base yeah the future rebel base future, future rebel yes. the masasi base the, yes oh. the abandoned masasi temple yeah <laughs> so this ep- this chapter really had a lot of fans debating, like, well, no, this is where Asajj died. This was back in the day where 
you could kill off a character and they're going to come back again because Asajj, well, another spoiler, didn't die until much later on. Where did she die in Clone Wars? We just saw it in that episode where Anakin backed her off the, the ledge. So she does no, die. No, Right. Yeah. Well, at that time period, she was considered dead. Then she came back for the Clone Wars for the movie, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Right. Okay. But they hadn't established that that had superseded this one. When 2008, when Star Wars The Clone Wars came out, had they established that that new series was superseding this one? Well, this Clone Wars yeah. is more Star Wars canon adjacent. Mm. So because Lucas wasn't directly involved mm-hmm. in it, he gave him the okay and to, again, to Tartakovsky, but said, you go and do this, I'm going to shoot Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. So he didn't have really any say in this. Okay. So it's really canon adjacent. Yeah. Which is why we see Asajj come back. Unless, Unless totally, the timeline I mean, is obviously different. now they, in 2014, they just said it's, this is totally just not canon. Which is uh, why they did that. Because right. like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. wait, how many times will these characters right. die? Although right. that, that having been said, I mean, her, it is kind of ambiguous whether she is actually dead or not. It's like the Schrodinger's she Ventress. Right. Right. She could easily catch herself somewhere. But yeah. As the adage goes, if you don't see the body, they're not dead. Right. right. And that certainly is a tradition in the Clone Wars, right? With Echo and uh, what's that clone in the crazy one? He goes down in a big firefight. I don't know. And then he eventually realizes, oh, yeah, I am a clone. I ran away. And then he saves them. And, oh, like, I remember that story. Yeah, I know, I know the episode. Oh, yeah. I don't um, recall his name. Yeah. Skywalker's tweeted us and tweeted at Jocasta Drew. At right. Skywalking Pod and <laughs> at Star Wars Maven. I was really excited, though, uh, to see Ayla Sakura for a moment in yes. with the Jedis. Because, I mean, she's just a really cool character. And I so, also, I cosplay her. Um, or I have in the past, uh, when the Liku didn't give me headaches when I was walking uh, around with them for eight hours in the convention. Yes. Um, but it was just really cool to see her, especially in those graphics. It was just really cool to see them all together, all the Jedi, and then seeing her just because I, I have a, a liking for her. So, yeah. Hold pretty. on. This just in from Drew. Gregor. 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 Ah. But then he go. comes back. Right. So that's what so you're that's saying. What I'm saying. Okay. I'm <laughs> and then also characters can be cut in half and come back. So. And can be dead again and come back in with metal legs. So right. <laughs> you're not, never really dead. And right. So, so right. That's, that's the thing with the Clone Wars is just because you see them, quote unquote, die off screen doesn't mean they actually die. Whether it's Gregor in the Clone Wars, whether it's Echo in the Clone Wars, or even Maul, who didn't die in the Clone Wars, but he was <laughs> certainly revived for the Clone Wars. Right. So they, even though this preceded the Clone Wars, there is that Star Wars tradition that even if you – that just because you see someone go off screen and presumably die doesn't actually mean they are really dead. Unless it's like Count Dooku and you see his head <laughs> fall off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Lucas and uh, Samuel L. Jackson, they were joking around yeah. like there could be a Mace Windu spinoff. There we could never be. saw him, his body. Same thing. <laughs> Yep. He amazing. lost a couple of arms and fell <laughs> multiple hundreds of stories. <laughs> but he but still could be. If he's he could, a Jedi. If he could do what he did right here in this uh, Dantooine arc yeah, right here. exactly. Where he's yeah. falling and flying from the big ship and wow. He doesn't yeah. need his arms to use the force. No. <laughs> no, he doesn't. That's <laughs> not how that force works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going on to that. That climactic battle, that last scene mm. on Hi- Harpori. Harpori, yes. Yeah. I do recall watching this one when I went back in 2004, mm-hmm. and I was so excited for this new character named General Grievous. Mm. And I was really excited because of the holiday special tie in. Anyone name it? How does this tie into the Star Wars holiday special? What happened in the holiday special? We were introduced to a new character yes. from an upcoming movie. Maybe I can help you. I am Boba Fett. Boba Fett? Boba Fett. In The Empire Strikes Back. Here we're introduced to General Grievous in an upcoming movie, Revenge of the Sith. So huh. did you know at that point that he would be introduced oh, in yeah. Revenge yeah, of the was, Sith? It was big. Okay. Okay. Right. So this was kind of like a, a selling point for watching this series? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Because okay. we were going to get... It was almost... This almost served as like a preview of Revenge of the Sith because wow. we're going to get uh, this new character. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. So uh, that, then I would have guessed that had I known that. Uh, yes. So that's so, my guess. So what my point is that it all comes back to the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> 
And who jibs? <laughs> and who jibs? Yes, <laughs> yeah. So I recall seeing this, and I was I was so excited about like, wow, th- this is what this Jedi killer is going to be doing. Mm. He's going to be stepping on on these oh. Jedi. Yeah. yeah, he stepped on the the, the Shaggy Jedi. Yeah, the Padawan. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Look, look like Shaggy from Scooby Doo. Yeah, the red shirts. <laughs> yeah, he went yes. running outside, and Grievous went whomp. There was nothing left of him. Yeah. And Grievous was just taking out Jedi left and right. And that's where we see Ayla Sakura in the yep. background. Yep. Yeah. And for the for the first time, I believe, we do see Coyote Mundi. Yeah. Coyote yeah. yeah, Mundi. I yeah. I don't recall seeing him in the last volume. Yeah, unless he was on the Jedi Council, was he? Oh, yeah. He is. But oh, but, re- oh for Star Wars Clone Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First time on screen. Yeah. It was really cool to see Grievous do the um, twirling of the lightsabers. Yeah. Like that was like the Jedi look surprised. They're like, whoa, like something is going on here. This is major. Like the, the, when he swirls two lightsabers in each arm and, or one in each and they're staring at him like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, what is this guy? <laughs> so. Little did they know there will be helicopter Jedi later or helicopter inquisitors yes. later. Yes. Well, little <laughs> did they know that this is just half of what Grievous could do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's got two more arms ready to go. No yeah. kidding. Yeah, so what he was doing and flipping around, we saw, we, we did see Grievous do some of those contortionist moves in Revenge of the Sith where he's mm-hmm. walking like a spider and, mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. But what he was doing on here was nothing that he ever did in the movies. So now, yeah. were you disappointed when you saw the movies then? Well, I, I, like you had said earlier, there's a big difference between what you can do in animation and what you can do. Well, I know Grievous was animated, but <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a big difference. You can take certain realistic liberties. liberties with animation. Right. Like this. For me, there are two two things I have to, to say to that. One is, yes, there is some disappointment, especially as, as awesome as he becomes in the third season. But there's something that happens at the end, I'm not going to say, it's a spoiler, that changes who he is. And so that affects him for uh, the third uh. movie. Yeah. Well, in this, uh. he was a killing machine. Yeah. And he, yeah. he would not stop. Whereas Revenge of the Sith, when he had a certain doubt in his mind or any oh, yeah. kind of, oh, wait a minute, this may not go my way, he's out of there. Fight or flight later. response, he's yeah. a flight. Which which is what they do for the first part of the first season of Star Wars, The Clone Wars, the, certainly the first seven seasons, where he just flees at the, like you say, sort of at any sign of doubt. There are like th- at least three battles in the first seven episodes of the first season <laughs> where he just drops everything and leaves. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I thought there was a, a big inconsistency there because yeah. what we saw on here, he was like a, a bulldozer. Yeah. All right, so I have a question then. Who came up with his design? Was that Gendy Tartakovsky? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Because this character was going to be Dirge from the volume one. Huh. Then Lucas said, hey, you know what? I want to start introducing these characters. So let's take Dirge out. Let's kill him off. And now it's going to be General Grievous. Okay. And we talked about this briefly at the end of when we talked about the last episode is that at the end of every episode, at the end of every um, chapter, um, we get to meet the new villain. Mm. And it was... Dirge right. in the first one and Ventress in the second one and now we get Grievous and now we're like looking forward to this next season where it's going to be the Grievous story like right. you can already yeah. tell like it was the Ventress story in this one mm-hmm. um, yeah. yeah and uh, um, a little spoiler alert this goes right up to Revenge of the Sith nice so we yeah. get to see Grievous kidnap Palpatine oh yeah a little bit of the story crawl hey. All right, so let's go around the room, and does anyone have any final thoughts on this second Clone Wars volume? Volume. All right, Nitsan? I'll I'll go first. Um, I don't have anything too deep, but I definitely think um, my expectations. You asked me at the last, the end of the last episode, what my expectation would be for this episode, and I think they were met beyond. Hmm. Um, I definitely got to see a lot of Ventress, which was what I was expecting and seeing her in detail, like seeing her fighting style and seeing her interaction with Anakin. It was almost like foreshadowing the Clone Wars, like hmm. the stuff that was their, their um, dynamic that comes in later. Um, and I, again, I think the, the scene where they're building the lightsaber is just phenomenal and, that exceeded anything I could have. I could have hoped for. I, I always get emotional in those scenes because it is awesome. Nice. You are one with the force. Yeah, the force is with me. <laughs> Drew, 
Yes. So I I love the battle on Dantooine. I love Mace Windu's just awesomeness. That's just hands down my favorite part. I love. I th- I found it really interesting. I'm Duel of the Fates is my favorite Star Wars song. So I love the inclusion here of of Anakin sort of going towards the dark side with it, mm. just as we had seen in him in Attack of the Clones when he took out those uh, the sand people so that was really fascinating to me and i'd love to hear your thoughts on the overall music stuff sarah (laughs) okay yeah all right well uh yeah that kind of ties into my final thoughts so i found it interesting that overall they they had a soundtrack to these episodes that would have music that was computerized like computerized like it didn't sound computerized but you could tell it was synthesized that's what i'm saying it was synthesized music but then every so often you'd hear parts of the score that was real instruments like you said like from duel of the fates and then also in the battle on dantamine with mace windu we heard some of that battle music from the phantom menace we also hear some of that like uh the battle droids that music huh. bum, ba-da-dum, ba-da-dum, ba-bum, yeah. ba-bum. so that part so every so often they would sprinkle in a bit of the themes that we know and love to kind of heighten everything or heighten certain moments so that's what i noticed about the music and those are it's kind of my final thoughts wrapping up there all right for me this does what the force awakens did not and use callbacks Mm. to certain characters and places. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. JJ would have killed you to put a Rodian somewhere in Maz Khan's <laughs> castle. Here, we're getting callbacks <laughs> with, with Dan Tween. We're getting Masasi Temple. We're getting I Have You Now. Yeah. Right. So, uh, there, there's even a callback to a deleted scene. Yeah, with, with <laughs> Luke, with young Luke. Yeah. yeah. So I I really love the fact that they're doing that, and I'm hoping they're, do, they're gonna do more in Volume Three, which we'll cover next time. One more thought on the Mace Windu episode: something we all laughed at. Well, Drew, me and you laughed at it. Yeah. Whereas Nitsan and Sarah were like, "What?" <laughs> at the very <laughs> very end, when Mace does a force leap and jumps right <laughs> right in front of the little boy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And little little boy hands him his drink. Yeah. <laughs> Which will, will, he has looking at us like, I don't get it. But back in the 1970s, there was an infamous Coca Cola commercial oh. where a football game had just ended, and Mean Joe Green goes walking back to the locker room, and his little boy says, Hey, Mean Joe Green, want a Coke? Mr. Green? Yeah. I, I just want you to know, I think, I think you're the best ever. Yeah, sure. Want my Coke? Okay. Thanks. And Mean Joe Green grabs it, and it's it was the best commercial of its time, <laughs> the most iconic commercial. And I'm I'm sure that's what they're doing, equating oh. this little boy handing Mace Windu this time. Mace Window being the mean, mean Joe Green character right. and hitting him a, a beverage after a big battle. Now, huh. this was in the 70s? Yeah. Well, why would Drew remember that? He's like my age. That's true, but I've seen, as a football fan, I've seen that commercial oh, out there. Okay. Right, but then little boy goes, walk. well, <laughs> Mean Joe Green drinks the whole Coke, and I'm sure the little boy meant, I... Dude, I'm in a sip. <laughs> Is this like me when I hand you the drink or some food? And the little boy turns around and walks away dejected. But then Mean Joe says, hey, kid, and throws him his football jersey. Aww. <laughs> so I almost expected his Mace, Mace to turn around Ew. and throw the kid his cloak, his tattered cloak. Aww. That would have been Awesome. Wow. But that never happened. That little too on the nose. I, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure they didn't want to go that, <laughs> yeah. that far because yeah. I'm sure Gendy would have said, you know what, Sarah, anytime we'll never get this. Let's just cut <laughs> it here. <laughs> it was fascinating how quickly the clothing got tattered, both Mace Window and then also Anakin with the Masasi Temple. They yes. just both got quickly. <laughs> and then the and Anakin, quite somehow, a war. Yeah. Anakin somehow lost his tunic underneath his. <laughs> His, the, straps? Uh, the straps, yeah. the rope straps. I was like, wait, wait, didn't he just have a shirt on? I was confused, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> he and Padme, wow. 
<laughs> just losing their clothing. Yeah. <laughs> All, All right. right. So let's wrap this up. And thank you, Nitsan, and thank you, Drew. Nitsan, Absolutely. you had one more thing to add. I, could tell. I do. I just had one more, one more moment when uh, Padme sends three PO out to be the target practice. Uh, three PO, could you get my coat? Of course, Miss Padme. Like that was kind of mean. Like <laughs> I see the the need of it, but it's three PO. You just threw him out there to get shot at. Mm-hmm. So they were sorry. bad shots too. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. well, she had to find out where those invisible droids were. Right? Yeah, and the only way she could see I, I that is when they I'm fired. Just like you just sacrificed your droid, your favorite one of your favorite droids for mm-hmm. target mm-hmm. practice. So see. <laughs> Well, at this point, those spider droids hadn't hit a thing. So what are the chances <laughs> of them hitting 3PO? Yeah. So true. She, Very as true. soon as the droids fired, she saw, oh, you're right there. Bam. Yeah. There goes one. There goes another one. There you yeah. go. <laughs> and there was another, almost a callback there when 3PO falls in the snow and he's complaining about being, being doomed like alive. on the Millennium yeah. Falcon <laughs> when he's buried in all the cables and wires and far too is going to come and save him. Yeah. Super cute. An interesting tidbit I found at the end of the Battle of Mutilants was that wolf Jedi. So apparently oh, yeah. there was a Cartoon Network, um, there was a contest. There was a poll to see which character from the most Icely Cantina and A New Hope would <gasps> come back and appear in the series. So Whoa. of the three, he was the one who won this wolf man. His name is actually like Wolfif Mon, but it's really just wolf man. And so he appeared and that's that's why he was there. Um, the funny thing is that the two losers of that actually reappear, spoiler alert, in season three, and they actually have a bigger role than he does. <laughs> so the, the funny thing is that the losers actually appear more and have speaking lines. Wow. But all three of them were in this contest and had originally been in, just been in the cantina. How funny. Which is too bad because I love me some wolf, man. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see more a wolf man. Yeah, maybe a I'm Frankenstein, sorry. maybe a vampire Jedi. <laughs> Bring on the sure. the monster movies. Yes. I don't know. You said Anakin already has like fangs after his <laughs> yeah. thing. You're pretty close there. <laughs> right. Just need no. a full moon. Yes. Yeah. Roll in that dark universe. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Jocasta Drew. Thank you, Nitsan. And we will see you with Volume Three. Thank you. Good yeah. night. Thank you. Shout outs. Skywalker shoutouts Which Skywalkers get props from here in Neverland? Who was tweeted out? Shout out! Who was photoball? Shout out! Who was shared a poll? Shout out! Post. Time for shoutouts! Now we want to give a huge shout out to Patrick Izzo! And Patrick, thank you very much for making me gain five pounds this week. <laughs> and why? Let's jump back in time to June the 1st when I posted this on Facebook. We were in Sam's Club and I noticed they were selling a product called Hostess Deep Fried Twinkies. Oh my gosh. I, I, I had to post this. In the freezer I, section. <laughs> y- yeah. I posted it on Facebook, not the freezer section, but these were in the freezer section. Right. And Patrick, he had commented and said, Twinkies are Bush League. <laughs> I'll send you a box of tasty cakes right from Philly. You'll never want another Twinkie fried or unfried again. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, guess what showed up a week later? Tasty cakes! A box, a carton (laughs) of tasty cakes. With this very nice message. Dear Rich and Sarah, as promised and closed, (laughs) and closed, please find genuine tasty cakes right from Philly. These beat Twinkies any day. Butterscotch, crimpets, and candy cakes were a staple of any Star Wars lunchbox back in the 80s. Thanks for all you guys do for the Skywalker family, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Sincerely, Pat Izzo. Aww. There's a postscript here. Yes. P.S. Some people like their candy cakes cold, so you can try them out of the fridge or freezer, oh. too. Yes, yes. Mmm, and we did. Yes. They're actually really good from the fridge. Very good. You know, in the fridge, out of the fridge, in the mouth. Yeah, and in fact, what's funny is the, what is it, the candy cakes are peanut butter and chocolate, which I thought I would like better, but I actually like the butterscotch crimpettes a little better. A weak, peanut butter on anything, a weakness. I, they're so good. Oh. oh, glad you guys enjoyed them. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we still have them. There's, there's, there's two boxes in our freezer and 
two boxes in our fridge. Yeah. So, um, oh my gosh. Update, Sarah. They're no longer there. Hey. They're no longer there. Come hey. on. They're peanut butter. How long <laughs> do you think those were going to last? Well, we yeah, we want to thank you. And thank you for enclosing also <laughs> the printout of why <laughs> you Facebook. sent these. Because oh, they're empty. Uh, because that was very helpful. Because <laughs> we're like, these are awesome. And, and we didn't quite remember. Like, <laughs> I didn't quite remember what this was referring to. So by you um, including the... This, this printout print of, of my post. It really helped. Like, oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah. So, Sarah, I, I left you the empty boxes in the freezer. Oh, well, I thank you. <laughs> so, my waistline thanks you. Yes. And we want to give a huge thanks to Patrick Izzo for helping me gain those last eight pounds. Mm -hmm. Gotta call that holiday weight. <laughs> All right. Now, let's move on to this fantastic selfie. Yes, so on Twitter, we always ask you to tweet a hashtag Skywalker selfie, and that is stop what you're doing right now. As you're listening, bring out your phone, take a selfie of whatever you're doing, and then post it on social media with hashtag Skywalker selfie. Well, Glenn Stein did just that, and he actually got a Skywalker selfie with Margaret Carey. Our fairy pod mother. And he happened to be at the Fanboy Expo in Knoxville, Tennessee, and actually drove three and a half hours each way to get that selfie. So, wow. wow. If that's dedication, I don't know what is. And he happened to be wearing his Skywalker of the yeah. Week shirt that day, too. So we want to give a huge shout out to Glenn Stein. Yeah, and thanks for representing Skywalking through Neverland at Fanboy Expo. And getting a selfie with Margaret Carey. Now, this next shout out comes from our Skywalking Through Neverland Facebook group, which, once again, you can join if you search for Skywalking Through Neverland group on Facebook and then request to join and then answer the little quiz questions. You have to answer those questions to be let in. Now, our Facebook group is a great way to get to know others, to get to make friends uh, virtually all over the world, and also for some helpful advice. So Carol Cantwell, she posted in the group yesterday, in need of some recommendations. I'm putting together a Star Wars camp for my niece with leukemia, who has to be mostly homebound this summer. She loves Ray and Jin and reading. So any great graphic novels out there I could get her or good sources for that kind of thing, thanks in advance. And the comments from Skywalkers, there must be 20 comments here from Skywalkers offering to send her books yeah. and just uh, offering advice on which books to, to do. Like Kai Charles says, the little golden books, Star Wars editions. <laughs> they have a Force Awakens one. Good for any age, by the way. Richard, you said Rebel Rising. Fantastic book. Yeah. And Donald Wicks actually offered, uh, she, he said that you can also make a request with the Rebel Legion and ask if they could possibly send a couple characters, Ray or Jin, to visit her with a link to where she could request that, which is so amazing. Missy Kaya said it depends on her age, but Ray's survival guide is fun. And let's see. Oh, Brian Sims. When and where is the event? Do you have time for a mail package? I can oh. put together a box of comic oh. books for you. So these... These are like so amazing. I guess it's in August uh, that this event is happening. And you know what? Even in the comments, Carol Cantwell responded and said, Thank you so much to all my fellow Skywalkers and to Richard and Sarah for nurturing such a generous community. You all have brought a lot of light already into a tough situation. Aww. Truly and deeply appreciated. So, oh, little girl. And oh. Kai Charles had offered to send a mini Lego kit. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Look at these, look at these Skywalkers. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. It's really, really amazing. Yeah. Aww. Look at these comic books that Brian's going to send. Mm -hmm. wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So we just... We just shout out to all you Skywalkers. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. And Thank if, you for helping each other. <laughs> if you want to be part of this positive, amazing Facebook group, yeah, just once again, request to join on Facebook. Make sure you answer those questions and you'll be a part of this great group. We love it. Yeah. And Carol, give us an update on, on how, how your niece is doing. Yes. Maybe a picture of her reading the comic books and any, any chance to see a child smiling. Always absolutely, worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, I'm not sure if this is sweat or tears. I this know. Is, that was heartfelt. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All right, now let's move on to the Skywalker of the Week. Michelle, Michelle Morris, Morris. Michelle, Michelle Morris, Morris. Michelle. 
We want to give a big shout out. Thank you, Michelle Morris, who posted on YouTube. Check out my favorite show with the best hosts. And well, she actually posted a link to YouTube. So that was really cool. Uh, we really appreciate that, Michelle. And we've definitely gone up some subscribers on our YouTube channel. So yay, we asked you guys to do that for YouTube and we really appreciate it. And if they do post something on YouTube, it bumps you right up to that top of the list for the Skywalker of the Week by our good friend and podcast composer, Rob Dellinger, who is... The John Williams of podcasting! <laughs> well, that wraps up episode 174 of Skywalking, Skywalking Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. We'd like to thank Drew Kaplan, Nitzan Harrell, Dave Partford for his fandom highlight moment, and all the Skywalkers who listen week in and week out. We appreciate you carving out some time to join us. Absolutely. And we want to give a big reminder here for our YouTube channel. Every week we share not only the show, we also share our behind the scenes of the show, which we're recording right now. And we also have our weekly series called Archival Revival, which is exclusive to YouTube. And this week in our Archival Revival playlist, we've posted more Star Wars Laserdisc supplemental material, including an interview with George Lucas on his casting choices, like especially Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, and also an interview with Ralph McQuarrie on his concept art, and also some behind the scenes stills from Star Wars. So be sure to head over to YouTube and subscribe, youtube.com slash skywalking through Neverland, and then you'll always be notified of these new videos every week, plus our live watch of the show every week. All right, so join us on YouTube, and then head on over to RetroZap.com, where you can find some great podcasts and some articles, reviews, mm -hmm. and once again, the podcasts, wow, so many great shows with so many great different points of view, like Brews and Blasters, the Beltway Banthas podcast, the DeuceCast movie show, Starship Sabres and Scoundrels, and Talking Apes TV, where we're about to record the series wrap-up <gasps> on Return to the Planet of the Apes. And we're going to also give our review for War for the Planet of the Apes. Whoa, awesome. Which we just saw at a press screening last week. I'm so happy. <laughs> Hashtag happiness. A Star Wars film and a Planet of the Apes film in the same year? Yeah. What a time we're living in. <laughs> Oh, I just put that together right now. It's like the 70s all over again. Oh, my goodness. Aww. Oh, long live the 70s. <laughs> and you can also find us over at jedinews.co.uk. Yes. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, we are at Skywalking Pod nearly everywhere. Twitter, Instagram. And then on Facebook, we are Skywalking Through Neverland. And make sure to email us those stories of fandom Email us, share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. I'm very excited to hear where people's people's mm -hmm. highlights are. Yes. Once again, not just stories, like, hey, I had a good time here and a good time here, but what really pushed the envelope mm -hmm. for fandom. Yes. All right, now, stay tuned, as always, for little bits of conversation and bloopers that didn't really make it into the main show. And right after that, stay cool. And always remember, never land on Alderaan. Some imagination, huh? <laughs>To our Skywalkers and Tweetwalkers, thanks for listening. Skywalking Through Neverland is created and produced by Richard and Sarah Woloski. Original music by Rob Dellinger. Creative consultant, Mark Ogushowitz. Technical advisor, Peter Heitman. Facebook administrators, Donald Wicks, Joey Pittman, and Norma Heitman. Skywalking Through Neverland is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Any sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is property of Skywalking Through Neverland, all rights reserved. Sorry, had to be said. I'm wearing a flash hat today. Do you guys know why? That's my way of saying, Lord Miller, bye. Go work on the flash. Stay out of Han Solo. Stay out of our territory. Don't belong. My commentary. Never knew why they belonged in the first place. But now, go back. You know what? Do I want them on the flash?
No. No, they, I don't think they're appropriate for a movie like that. You know, a Lego movie, perfect for them. 21 Jump Street, doesn't matter which way you go with that one. But, I don't know, Star Wars, The Flash, I, I just don't want to see The Flash acting like Ace of Ventura. Okay. Yay! We're done! There you go. All right, we're going to go towel off. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for joining us once again. Much appreciated. Wow. Oh.